Andrew Solomon. Good evening to you all. Very nice to have an event without metal detectors as you come in this year. I want to welcome you to Penn's largest and most successful gala ever. We have raised more than $1.75 million tonight, far ahead of our goal. I honor the gala co-chairs, Kathy Graham, Jay McInerney, and Alexandra Monroe, and our honorary chairs, Tony Goodell and Annette Tappert. I thank the remarkable committee who have pulled this off and the literary hosts who have been such valiant supporters of our work. I acknowledge Penn's tireless staff under the leadership of our executive director, the exceptional Suzanne Nossel. And I am also grateful to our generous award benefactors, Annette Tappert and Joe Allen, Tony and James Goodale, and Pam and Peter Barbie. And I extend warmest thanks to all of you our guests and supporters who strengthen Penn's mission to celebrate literature and defend freedom of expression. Penn's new logo, evocative of both a book and a thought bubble, reflects our commitment to speaking, writing, and thinking. Our defining values are likewise celebrated in a new tagline, the freedom to write. A few months ago, my husband and I asked our six-year-old son where in the world he'd most like to go. George thought for a moment, then said, Syria. <laughs> John and I were alarmed. Syria? George, why on earth would you choose Syria? Using a phrase that is common parlance in our household, he said, Someone has to tell those people about inappropriate behavior. <laughs> when I recounted this story to the celebrated Iranian-American writer Azar Nafisi recently, she said, perhaps he could go to Washington first. <laughs> the current election cycle has repeatedly called into question the principle that words uttered, written down, heard, are the most powerful basis there has ever been for social justice. We have a presidential candidate who deploys insults and unapologetic lies to consolidate his power. We face a larger political establishment that has deliberately escalated xenophobia frightening everyone so much that many Americans won't leave their country, nor rise to welcome those who knock on our door. The statement, we'll build a wall, is itself a wall of words. It subverts the singular ability of language to help us sympathize with people who are different from us. Hatred is the inevitable consequence of this linguistic pollution of using speech to construct barriers where we need bridges. People love and tolerate one another in words. There has never been a peace treaty that did not make use of them, nor any redress of human inequalities without something being said or written. There is a principle in biblical interpretation that the angels on the Ark of the Covenant were placed to face each other to denote that God exists between people, more in the discourse than in those who are discoursing. Language substantiates that profound interstitial meaning. 
in the current electoral fandango, candidates have banked on the idea that voters won't care whether what they are being told is true, so long as they like its emotional thrust. Let all of us in this room stand for the higher use of language on sustaining truth when powerful forces seem hell-bent on annihilating it. I am sometimes asked about Penn's dual mission to champion literature and to fight for free speech. I see no dichotomy. With the phrase, the freedom to write, we contend that what is said through high art, via journalism, or by anyone voicing a well-considered opinion are all connected. If reporters don't find common cause with novelists, if essayists do not recognize the activists who confront corrupt power, we will all be diminished. There is no such thing as free speech only for writers. William Carlos Williams declared, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. At Penn, we hold free speech to a high standard. Free speech entails the news that censors wish to hide and the poetry that reveals our nature to us. A good book is both a window and a mirror. It allows us to see things we'd otherwise be unable to imagine, but it likewise reveals us to ourselves. Sometimes the mirror is harder to face than the window. It is becoming so now. The German natural scientist Alexander von Humboldt once said, the most dangerous worldview is the worldview of those who have not viewed the world. We cannot view the whole world physically, but we can encounter it by reading. Opposition can weaken speech, but it can likewise strengthen it. Those whose speech is most constrained are often the ones who whisper with greatest urgency. We at Penn are a noisy, obstreperous lot. Silence is not so golden around here. No one who cares about literature will forget the image of children lining up outside bookshops as they awaited J.K. Rowling's next release, drawn along by delightful storytelling that is also exquisitely moral. Those who read Rowling's work emerge better suited to build a principled world. My eight-year-old daughter has asked deeper questions since she started these books, questions that relate to both joy and decency. It is an extraordinary privilege to have J.K. Rowling with us tonight. I want to offer a word of undying gratitude to our publishing honoree, Hachette CEO, Michael Peach. He is J.K. Rowling's publisher, a Penn board member, treasured protector of authors, intrepid industry champion against strong odds, and unflagging standard bearer for free speech. A free speech organization advances the freedom to be heard. Tonight we honor Leanne Walters and Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha the women who exposed the inconceivable disgrace of the poisoned water supply in Flint, Michigan. The voices of the disenfranchised 
are seldom heard by those elected to represent them. These two women made their cause audible even as local and state governments tried repeatedly to discredit them as hysterics. We also honor Ahmed Nadji, who languishes in prison in Egypt, where a constitution that protects the rights of writers and journalists is routinely and unabashedly flouted. We think tonight of others on whose cases Penn is working too, too many to list here, among them Ashraf Fayyad, who was sentenced to death in Saudi Arabia on grounds that his poems were incitements to atheism. We joined the effort through which his sentence has been commuted to eight years in prison and 800 lashes, which is said to constitute benevolence and mercy. From Russia to Nigeria, the persecution of gay people violates their civil liberties. Without free speech, gay people can achieve no open, authentic selves. Penn is in conversation with whistleblowers from Edward Snowden on down, who have lost jobs, reputations, even their freedom because they dared to speak out. We recognize Black Lives Matter, women silenced by misogyny, and people yanked off airplanes here in this country because their seeming to be Muslims made others uncomfortable. In February, Penn brought a delegation of freedom-defending Russian writers to the United States. We talked about how Russians have become vulnerable to propaganda in Putin's Russia, but also how we are deluged with it. Commenting on Putin's supposed 85% approval ratings, the renowned novelist Ludmila Ulitskaya characterized the meeting as our 15% speaking to your 15%. Too easily, our personal right to privacy gets conflated with government's undue secrecy. Too often, our need for security is put forward to justify intrusive surveillance. The first award presented tonight is the Jerry, L the Jerry Labor International Freedom to Publish Award, named for munificent Penn trustee, Jerry Labor, who is here tonight. It is given to a publisher outside the United States who has demonstrated exceptional bravery. And this year goes to Bangladeshi publishing house, Shudhashar. Shudhashar has incurred the wrath of Islamic extremist groups for printing and distributing secular and rationalist work. Penn has drawn the world's attention to a pattern of murders of secular bloggers and publishers in Bangladesh, many of whom have been hacked to death. We have spurred the United States to offer safe haven to those most at risk and are galvanizing the United Nations to act as well. Mahbub Lilan joins us tonight on behalf of Shudhashar. Please stand. We salute you for your fearless battle against censorship at great personal risk. Now, please join me in welcoming Donna Tart, Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Goldfinch and The Secret History, to bestow the publishing award on Michael Peach. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. I'm honored to be here to introduce this year's publisher honoree, Michael Peach. Apart from being CEO and publisher of Hachette, 
Michael's also my editor. And I can tell you just how beloved he is by all of us lucky enough to have worked with him. But what's so singular about Michael is that he brings to the literary world at large the very same gifts that make him such a supportive editor and a sensitive reader. That is to say, his wisdom, his intelligence and energy and kindness, and his very nearly unfailing patience, even when he's tired and overworked, as he pretty much always is. Michael was a Chaucer scholar at Harvard, and I love that if you ask him nicely enough, he'll be happy to recite from the Canterbury Tales in Middle English for you. But if you look at the list of Michael's writers, I think you'll see, too, how wonderfully enthusiastic and broad a reader he is. And he's very, very practical as well, with a strong sense of fairness and balance, which is what makes him not only a responsible publisher and astute CEO, but also such a good citizen in the larger republic of letters. He has an eye for both the forest and the trees, the near and the far. And even with all the huge decisions he's constantly forced to make, he's attentive as well to detail, with an eye to how even seemingly tiny matters might evolve and grow, and ultimately prove significant, if not crucial, in ways that not everyone might foresee. He's also shown himself over and over to be a brave publisher. If you look at your program, you can see a few of the many, many ways in which he's been a force for good with Penn and the National Coalition Against Censorship. With his decision to publish the posthumous manuscript of Charlie Hebdo editor, Stéphane Charbonnier, a book which many less courageous publishers would have found it very, very easy to pass on as it involved armed guards, public controversy, a considerable amount of anxiety and expense, and no financial incentive to speak of, and his efforts to resist censorship of works in translation in China. It's this wide field of engagement that animates Michael's work throughout. He's in love with books. He loves the whole marketplace and machinery of producing books. He loves every possible aspect of the literary culture, including a lot of its more difficult and less glamorous aspects. All Michael's wide variety of work in all his nearly 40 years of publishing is illumined by his readerly enthusiasm and his knowledge that the abiding power of the written word can provide for those of us who love books a still point outside the world, outside time, outside oppressive ideologies and regimes, sometimes outside even death. We're all fortunate to have in the publishing world someone of his strength and integrity to say nothing of his gentleness and charm. And I am delighted to invite him to the stage to accept this award. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and my joy to present to you this year's publisher honoree, Michael Peach. Thank you, Donna Tart, for those extraordinarily kind and beautifully composed words. Oh my God, oh my God. And thank you for your glorious books. I want to thank my wonderful colleagues at Hachette for their very hard work preparing for tonight and soliciting contributions as so many have done, especially Sophie Cottrell, Eve Rabinovitz, Reagan Arthur, Jamie Rabb, Megan Tingley, Ronald Blunden, and Ashat Livre Global Chairman Arlon Nouri, who is with us tonight. Thank you to all the writers supporting Penn by gracing this dinner, especially those published by Hachette. Thank you for trusting us. Thank you for trusting us with your books and for your partnership. Thank you to all the warm and generous colleagues here tonight, publishers, literary agents, 
booksellers, manufacturers, paper makers, legal counsel, and other friends. We are fortunate people drawn together in this ancient and delightful work connecting writers to readers. And thank you most especially to the redoubtable, courageous, and glorious J.K. Rowling for being with us. The first rule with Penn is if they ask you, say yes. It is an honor to be singled out by them in any way, and I thank them for this singling out. We've all been singled out by being included here, and I want to thank everyone who has donated so generously to Penn, especially those of you here for the first time. I hope that you'll be moved to join in Penn's work and to return year after year. Because what Penn does is elemental to the business of publishing. Free speech and the freedom to write are the foundation upon which most of the people in this room build their living. Those of us on the publishing side like to imagine that writers have many supporters, and we can lose sight of what a solitary endeavor it is to create works out of nothing but your ideas and your words. Solitary, daring, and sometimes dangerous work, sometimes literally death-defying work. At the times that writers are at their greatest risk and most alone when there is no publisher or other supporter in sight, it is important to know that Penn is there watching, listening, speaking out, fighting for writers. And this is a very serious moment. Many writers' lives, livelihoods, and freedom are in peril today. When truth and creative expression are met in so many places with censorship, disenfranchisement, with violence, with worse, it's a serious time. All over the world, writers live in peril. We hear sometimes here in New York's echo chamber about the publishing business being in peril. I love reading histories of publishing because of how comforting it, comforting it is to read that publishers basically have always thought they were just about to perish. <laughs> Postal regulations were going to do us in in the 1800s, and at the start of the 20th century, the demon of discounting was considered so lethal that publishers fought Macy's, the first discounter, all the way to the Supreme Court and lost. I don't mean to make light of the publishers uh, the, of the challenges that publishers and writers face in a business that has changed more in a decade than it changed in the century before. Nor do I want to dismiss the fact that in many parts of the world, publishers do face very serious threats. But in the U.S., book publishing is not in peril. We have our battles, but we find our way. Writers and publishers have always needed each other, and we should have faith that in our mo ever more complex world, we always will. So publishers, Let's be optimists about our business. The serious issue today is not a threat to us, but the threat to the writer's voice that is flashing around the globe and here in our cities, our campuses, our school boards, our state houses. Let us be brave and not too safe. And remember to publish wild voices, diverse voices, voices that make us uncomfortable, voices that can open eyes, change minds, and last. Everyone has their favorite memory of a writer's work that changed their life or got them through a difficult time, and I'd like to close with mine. We'd had a death in the family, and Janet and I and our two children uh, were driving home from emptying out a parent's house in Tulsa. We were Okies in reverse, heading east, pulling a U-Haul full of photos and furniture and a beautiful yellow wheelbarrow. And we had a new novel with us, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And we did something we'd never done before. The four of us decided to take turns reading aloud a chapter apiece. And as we drove through Ohio and Indiana, that amazing boy's story came alive in our family's voices. And it felt as if we were fighting alongside Harry. And his story brought us through grief and bad weather and all that corn and delivered us home a little healed and closer than we'd ever been before. I want to thank Penn for their single-minded support of the writer's voice and the freedom to write, the freedom that protects every family's ability to find the books that can change their life. I particularly want to say how fortunate we are in this serious time to have the energy, alertness, and articulate brilliance of Penn President Andrew Solomon and Executive Director Suzanne Nossel. Thank you. Ladies. 
the water of Flint, Michigan has been poisoned. The problems began when the city switched its water source to the Flint River to save money. But the corrosive river water wasn't properly treated and stripped lead from pipes. Children were being contaminated by lead. Lowered IQ, emotional problems, behavioral problems. This is the personal health equivalent of having been shot. Leanne Walters started noticing physical and developmental delays in her kids. We found out my child had lead poisoning. We were told by the state nurse, it's just a few IQ points. It's not the end of the world. Leanne blamed the water. I went up to the emergency manager. He's like, I don't believe that's your water. No more poison! No more poison! Complaints were met with aggressive dismissal, belittlement, and attempts to discredit. City officials continue to say the water meets all state and federal standards. We're not making any recommendations for changed behavior. The city's still putting out reports. Here's the plan. But the water's fine, and it's not. I decided we need to get to the science if anyone was ever going to believe us. I started researching and educating myself about water because people had a right to know. Her story sparked researchers to do their own testing. They were the worst results we've seen in 25 years. When pediatricians hear about lead anywhere, we freak out. A local doctor started studying blood samples from kids in Flint. Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha led the study on children. What we found was alarming. The percentage of children with elevated lead levels doubled in the whole city. And in some neighborhoods, it tripled. So we shared these results at a press conference. Right away, the state attacked me. The state of Michigan tried to dismiss her study. I was called an unfortunate researcher that I was splicing and dicing numbers. When the state tells you you're wrong, you second guess yourself. But that lasted just a short period, and we told them why, no, you were wrong. Two weeks later, officials acknowledged her findings were correct. President Obama declared Flint, Michigan, a disaster area, clearing the way for federal aid. It took a village of incredibly brave people to expose this. This was the ultimate betrayal for the citizens. I wouldn't shut up. They messed with the wrong mama. My personal mission in this now is to change the way the state is testing for lead and copper. My job as a pediatrician is to make sure that the kids have the brightest future ahead of them. Our story is not done. We have to give them hope. We'll hopefully inspire others to use their voices when they see injustices to speak up. Ladies and gentlemen, Jamie Goodell. And Tony Goodell. I'm here to present the pen. What am I doing here? I don't know. I'm here to present the Tony and James Goodell Award to our two charming guests on my right, and I'm very proud to do so. Uh, doctor, you were quite right to say that your neighbor here should not be messed with by the state of Michigan. And if I may so say so, the state of Michigan shouldn't mess, mess with you either. You both showed great courage in taking on the state of Michigan. Thank you. By presenting this award to Leanne and Mona, we do hope to inspire others who discover injustices to have the courage to speak up as they did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
thank you, or, or we'll never get to dessert. Thank you. <laughs> it is an incredible honor to stand here today to receive this award. Um, and most incredibly, it's an honor to stand here next to Leanne Walters. And in Flint, we would be nowhere without Leanne. Her stubbornness, her effective activist, activism started the domino effect. And without her, our children would still be drinking lead-tainted lead water. She is definitely a mama that you do not want to mess with. She's amazing. I also briefly want to recognize my parents and my daughter who are here. If you could please stand up. My, my parents instilled in me the values that led me to stand up. We are Iraqi American. We left Iraq when I was five years old, 35 years ago, so I just aged myself, um, because we did not have the freedom of, of expression. My grandfather was a political prisoner. He lost his job and his career because he spoke up. My dad, when he went away to college, the Baathists came in power, and my grandmother had to wrap all of his books with red blankets and hide them underground. Um, so we understand the meaning of freedom of, exp of expression. Um, and even when we came to the States, they led by example and kept speaking up, especially of the atrocities that continued in Iraq, uh, the poisoning of children in Halabsha. And that is how I grew up. That was the background of my childhood, which is very much in my DNA and is the DNA of Penn. Um, on a lighter note, my daughter is here. She is 10, and she came here to see Miss Rowling because <laughs> Miss Rowling, through, through your books, through your Harry Potter series, you have taught us, taught children, millions of children to stand up and you have taught us um, to stand up against racism and against justice, or for justice, so thank you, thank you. And I just wanna end by sharing that our story is nowhere near over in Flint. We are in our third year of water that we cannot drink. One month ago, we had a home with a lead level of 22,905 parts per billion, and the EPA action level is 15 parts per billion. So our story is nowhere near done. Um, and we had many, 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 many courageous um, people who were expressing um, their words and, and going to town hall meetings and standing up with brown water and trying to have their voices heard. But Flint was a town that lost its democracy. And when you have no democracy, who listens to those voices? Um, but people, many, many, many moms and journalists and experts from Virginia Tech and brave EPA officials, I mean, they were all dismissed and they were ridiculed. And when I shared evidence that our children were being dismissed, I was ridiculed and I was dismissed and I was scared and I wanted to hide under a blanket. Um, and I second guessed myself, and I guess when you have, you can't have courage without fear, and I had that fear, but you know, you have to have that fear, and that's how you grow, and that's how you, you, save, you save cities, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, already the story of Flint, perhaps just like the story of Rachel Carson, um, where her story with DDT has changed the conversation, not only about lead, but about water, but about democracy, about austerity, about environmental racism, about indifferent bureaucracies, about deadly infrastructure. But most importantly, it's a story about forgotten places and forgotten people. But I want to leave you with a, a little bit of hope. We're hoping to flip the story in Flint, and we're hoping to build something that's never been built before for our children because these children did nothing wrong besides live in a poor city that did, didn't treat its water properly. Um, so come back and visit us in 10, 20 years, and you'll hear Flint um, be, be known for a story of hope, um, especially for our children who rose up from this and, and thrived because of this disaster. Um, so I'm going to take it over to Leanne because I spoke too much. I feel honored and blessed to be here to receive the 2016 Tony and James C. Goodall Freedom of Expression Courage Award. I want to say thank you to my best friend, who is my husband, Dennis, who cannot be here tonight, who has been my rock through all of this, and thank you to my amazing children, Kaylee, JD, Gavin, and Garrett, with all the, out there, all their love and support, the crazy hours that we spend doing this would not be possible. <laughs> I want to say thank you to the first people to believe me when nobody else would, which would be Miguel Del Toro from the EPA and Professor Mark Edwards. They are two of the best mentors that anybody could ever ask for in this. I want to congratulate Dr. Mona, 
who is also being honored here. Thank you for all your hard work on behalf of the children of Flint and your efforts to ensure that our children have the brightest futures possible. I want every resident in Flint to know that I am not accepting this award just for myself, but for every one of us who was ridiculed, dismissed, and demeaned and ignored in our fight for clean water. We are one. We, were, we are given this award because we refused to be silenced. Flint's crisis is far from over. We are still fighting for medical coverage for adults who have been affected. We are still fighting for safe, clean water. I will continue to speak out until Flint and every other community in the United States has led free water. I will continue to fight. I will continue to fight until the lead and copper rule is properly revised to protect people. I will not stop until I am assured no mother will ever be asked again by her child, mommy, is this clean water or yucky water? Like my five-year-old twins ask me daily. Because of what my family and the other families in Flint continue to go through, I, along with other Flint residents, have now launched a nonprofit to assist the forgotten in this. I thank you again for having me here tonight. Some say it's courage, some say it's heroism, but I'm honestly just a mom doing what moms do, protecting their children. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sarah Jessica Parker. Good evening. Um, this must be done. May I just begin by saying how honored and thrilled I am to be here tonight. I feel I'm proxy for every mother and every child. I feel I'm speaking for millions and billions of people who would like to say the very same thing. I am presenting J.K. Rowling with the 2016 Penn Allen Award. There is nothing quite so rewarding as watching a child open a book and discover the utter enchantment that awaits them in the world of words. And I think there can be no mistake in declaring that J.K. Rowling changed the landscape of children's literature forever and for the better with her introduction of Harry Potter to the world. As a voracious reader myself, I recall the joy and the enormous satisfaction I felt when my son, James Wilkie, started reading the Harry Potter series because for him, like for so many, it was the gateway to loving books for life. And he loved reading those books. And it wasn't only because he enjoyed the story. The characters resonated so deeply with him, I recall so specifically James Wilkie seen such distinct qualities in the Harry Potter characters. He loved to deconstruct, to take the stories apart, to rip them apart, to see how their choices not only dictated the story, but changed them, helped them to grow. He learned about honor, humility, dedication, and resilience. He began to understand human nature and he arrived at this on his own, rather than Miss Rowling teaching lessons, finding the delight and great satisfaction in everyday things, that sense of possibility, of optimism and hope is evident in all of her writing. And so too is a deep sense of right and wrong, of friendship 
and love, and the most difficult of all, staying true to oneself. I believe to this day that James Wilkie's keen interest in story development and books that offer distinct characters and rich, complex storytelling come directly from his early exposure to her extraordinary voice and her deep love and respect for her readers. Of course, we know that the Harry Potter stories went on to sell over 450 million copies worldwide in 200 territories <laughs> and 79 languages. And let us not forget about the movies, eight blockbuster films and three theme parks, all part of her impressive wizarding world. But most impressive of all, uh, and most important, an entire generation of readers, my son included, who grew up with the understanding that books contain magic and that reading can not only teach us about ourselves, but others, and can indeed help us make the world a better place. But J.K. Rowling is more than Harry Potter. Her first novel for adult readers, The Casual Vacancy, was a bestseller that was made into a BBC and HBO television, television series. And in 2013, she was unmasked as the crime, Arthur, crime author Robert Galbraith with three titles, The Cuckoo's Calling, The Silkworm, and career of evil, all critically acclaimed. One would think that with a career like that, Miss Rowling would have little time left to devote to other activities. And yet, in between her writing, she changed the world again. The 2016 Penn Allen Award is bestowed to an author whose work embodies its mission to oppose repression in any form and to champion the best of humanity. Humanity, I believe, starts with children, and there is no greater indicator of our own humanity than in how we treat the most vulnerable among us. Ms. Rowling's work in founding LUMOS, which helps institutionalize children across the world return to family life, and her charitable trust, Volant, which works to alleviate poverty and social deprivation among women and children is proof of that. And just last year, Lumos won the prestigious All Over Charity honor from the Civil Society of Media's 2015 Charity Awards, despite being a young and still growing organization. And now with its recent launch in the United States, Lumos is growing and reaching more and more children who do so desperately need help. Her charitable efforts are improving the world in broad strokes, but one family at a time. But on a lighter note, I believe she's also improving the world in other ways too, namely on Twitter. Her Twitter account, as you might imagine, is truly a sight to behold. In a place where harassment and cyberbullying are not uncommon, J.K. Rowling uses her platform to speak out against injustices, to rally for what's right, and to encourage her readers to be themselves. But perhaps my favorite story, though, um, is when a library on a remote Scottish island tweeted about their plans to discuss one of her novels. Um, Miss Rowling showed up to their book club <laughs> to discuss the novel. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> what an unbelievable way to like make someone's day. <laughs> oh my God. Um, anyway, it's hard to believe that the world has only, know, know, only known the existence of J.K. Rowling for 20 years because she feels timeless. Her work is classic. This coming year, we'll have two new projects to look forward to, including the Harry Potter and the Cursed Child stage play, and her screenwriting debut for Fantastic, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. I'm sure you, like myself, cannot wait to see what comes next. So I am thrilled to honor the extraordinary J.K. Rowling tonight and to bear witness to her unparalleled gift for storytelling and changing the world 
one child at the time, one child at a time. And now to present the 2016 Penn Allen Award, Literary Service Award, is Annette Tappert Allen, the award sponsor. Thank you on behalf of the Allen family, children, and now grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're not alone. Glasses must also be worn by this person. Oh. I'm blushing. Uh, firstly, I want to say thank you very, very much for this huge honor, given as it is by an organization that I have admired very deeply for many, many years. It's also been an absolute privilege to share this stage tonight with your uh, previous honorees. Penn's campaigns on behalf of imprisoned writers are essential and inspirational, though it is sad to reflect how much, how needed your defense of writers continues to be today. Speaking personally, I have very little to complain about where my freedom of expression is concerned. I was once confronted by a Christian fundamentalist in a toy shop here in New York. I had no idea the phrase, I'm praying for you could sound so intimidating. <laughs> A bomb threat was once made to a store at which I was appearing. The premises were searched, nothing was found, the event went ahead. And the Harry Potter books have figured frequently on lists of the most banned, but as such lists feature many of my favorite writers, I've always been very flattered to be included. <laughs> of course, I can afford to take these things lightly protected as I am by citizenship of a liberal nation where freedom of expression is a fundamental right. My critics are at liberty to claim that I'm trying to convert children to Satanism, and I'm free to explain that I'm exploring human nature and morality, or to say you're an idiot, <laughs> depending on which side of the bed I got out of that day. However, I've never taken these freedoms for granted. In my 20s, I worked for Amnesty International, where I learned exactly how high a price people across the world have paid and continue to pay for the freedoms that we in the West sometimes take for granted. In fact, I worry that we may, may be in danger of allowing their erosion through sheer complacency. The tides of populism and nationalism currently sweeping many developed countries have been accompanied by demands that unwelcome and inconvenient voices be removed from public discourse. Mainstream media has become a term of abuse in some quarters. It seems that unless a commentator or a television program, channel or a newspaper reflects exactly the complainant's worldview, it must be guilty of bias or corruption. Intolerance, alternative viewpoints, is spreading to places that make me, a moderate and a liberal, most uncomfortable. Only last year, we saw an online petition to ban Donald Trump from entry to the UK. It garnered half a million signatures. Just a moment. <laughs> now, I find almost everything that Mr. Trump says objectionable. I consider him offensive and bigoted, but he has my full support to come to my country and be offensive and bigoted there.
his freedom to speak protects my freedom to call him a bigot. His freedom guarantees mine. Unless we take that absolute position without caveats or apologies, we have set foot upon a road with only one destination. If my offended feelings can justify a travel ban on Donald Trump, I have no moral grounds on which to argue that those offended by feminism or the fight for transgender rights or universal suffrage should not oppress campaigners for those causes. If you seek the removal of freedoms from an opponent simply on the grounds that they have offended you, you have crossed a line to stand alongside tyrants who imprison, torture, and kill on exactly the same justification. I'd like to conclude these remarks by reading you two short passages from the blog of a teenage girl. In 2009, Talal Maluhi became one of the youngest prisoners of conscience in the world when she was taken from her home by Syrian security forces. She was 18 years old. Her friends and family had to wait 11 months to find that she had been charged with giving aid to a foreign country. Her parents have been permitted to see her only once. There are fears she may have been tortured. This is some of the material that was considered so dangerous and inflammatory that she remains incarcerated. I do not like the words of the poet Rudyard Kipling, the East is East and the West is West and never the twain shall meet. Instead, I promote the union of the East and West. They meet somewhere. With rational thought, two great souls from here and from there can agree with each other irrespective of the vast separation of time and space. Oh, my brother human, if I disagree with you in thoughts, principles, or beliefs, does this deny the fact that we are both human? All you and I have to do is to respect each other, tolerate the views of your opponents coolly and patiently. While listening to them, do not think to respond before listening to all opposing opinions. I repeat that beautiful plea for plurality, tolerance, and the importance of rational discourse in the hope that Talal Maluhi, Maluhi will soon be freed. In the meantime, long may Penn continue to fight for her, for the freedoms on which a liberal society rests, and without, no, and without which no literature can have value. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Let us look inside ourselves for a revolution, and let us look to the novel. The thing about Nagy is that he's not just a novelist. I mean, he, he's a columnist, he's a journalist, he's an art critic. You know, he founded a, a theater space, an art magazine. I would describe Ahmed as a person that challenges taboos. And if you read Ahmed's work, you can definitely tell that it's about pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable societally or not. His novel, Using Life, had illustrations, you know. It was made into a multimedia show. It starts in a happy way where all these young people are celebrating the lack of surveillance and of security in the streets right after the revolution. And then it sinks into this whole dystopian Cairo that sucks everyone's soul, you know? Ahmed combined the taboo of sexuality 
and the taboo of drug use. Being arrested for him was not a surprise. What he was surprised about was that it wasn't his political commentary or activism, but rather a novel. Uh, there is someone who went to the police office and accused me for disturbing public morals and hurt him and hurt his feeling personally. We saw this is like a kind of uh, a comic case and the prosecution is going to close it. This is a novel. It has been approved by the Egyptian authorities uh, like a novel and published and sold out in all the Egyptian markets as a novel. هو بيحاسبني انا شخصيا بصفتي بطل الروايه فبطل الروايه مثلا المفروض انه بيشرب سيجاره حشيش فوكل النيابه يقول المحامين ده كده انا ممكن اعمل قضيه حشيش لاحمد ناجي that trial happened he was acquitted so everyone thought you know everyone took a breath and uh, the prosecutor was allowed two weeks to to appeal and they did it was a shock we thought that no one can break the constitution, so it was shocking for us to hear the maximum sentence. He was transferred to prison. To have Ahmed Nagy be sentenced for fictional writing and being actually sent to jail for that, um, it's unprecedented, at least for Egypt, for this country. Persecuting Nagy means persecuting a generation, you know? I think that the, there is no future now for the freedom of expression in Egypt. It just doesn't stop at Ahmed, and that's what we are afraid of. This is the nightmare. I've spent months in that prison where he is right now, and I told him what anyone in this situation wants to hear, that there is solidarity behind you. The public outcry that followed his sentence was unbelievable. Everyone was so angry at this unacceptable case. His case has galvanized the Egyptian literary community, and we want to stand in solidarity with them and make it not just an Egyptian cause, but an international cause. The Freedom of Write Award is a very powerful tool. Over the years, 35 out of 40 recipients have been released due in part to the pressure that's generated by this award and the surrounding publicity. Naji, we're proud to give this award in your honor. We're proud that you have the courage to be an example to writers everywhere. A heartfelt thank you. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your bravery. I gave the award news to Ahmed while visiting him in prison, and he was so excited and happy. He didn't lose hope at all. He's writing now in prison, and he's almost finishing his new novel. There is no greater freedom than freedom of the imagination. It is our hope, our optimistic hope, that giving this award to Ahmed Naji will bring him to freedom. Maybe, maybe, if we could get Ahmed released, something will change. Some other people will have hope to fight this. In cases where authorities are trying to silence these individuals, we have the opportunity to step in and make sure that their words and their stories are heard, that their face is seen, that their name is repeated. When the government tries to deny them a voice, we can be their voice. Before we continue, I just want to take a moment and ask all the writers in the room, our literary hosts, and anybody else who considers yourself a writer, and we're not going to go back and check, I want you to stand, and I want to just celebrate you and give you a round of applause. So if you're a writer, please stand up. Thanks for that. At Penn, as you can tell, we love to celebrate. But we don't celebrate just for the fun of it, or even just to see all of you. We celebrate to propel the defense of free expression worldwide. 
Tonight's focus is Egypt. For 30 years, Egypt was under the iron rule of Hosni Mubarak. Detentions, arbitrary arrests, rampant corruption. But for Washington, a cruel leader was also a crucial ally. In 2010, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton told it straight to Mubarak and other Arab leaders, the region's foundations are sinking into sand. You can't cling to the status quo. That sand was slipping faster than anyone knew. A Tunisian fruit seller set himself on fire. His charred body became a symbol for people throughout the region burned by indulgent and indifferent rulers. We were wrapped to our TVs and our Twitter feeds as millions poured into Cairo's Tahrir Square. They painted signs, penned slogans, posted photos, protested and proclaimed that nothing short of democracy would do. Mubarak shut down the internet, but he couldn't shut off the will of the people. Washington teetered between giddy and gloomy. Was this the dawn of democracy or the descent of chaos? When the government fell, artists stood up. Dances staged outside the stock exchange. Revolutionary graffiti festooning city streets. A festival of literature, painting, and puppetry on the square outside the presidential palace. But freedom was fleeting. That inspiring film footage we'd all watched on YouTube began to slowly rewind. Flags furling up, graffiti erased, people walking back indoors. A uniformed leader, General Abdel al-Sisi, back at the podium. A revolution vanished vanished except in the minds of individuals. Those who came of age to the sound of protests and chants. People like Ahmed Naji. In a different life, he'd be living in Bushwick. He'd be coming, be the young novelist with the mustache at tonight's after party. But instead, He's given up his liberty to defend the fading freedoms of 82 million Egyptians. In January, he wrote, the problem has become not that the regime pursues its opponents, but that it hunts down all signs of life. Culture and art are forbidden. While our government withheld aid from al-Sisi at first, now the funds are flowing again. U.S. officials say we need Egypt's help on ISIS. But these are hard choices. Now making those hard choices is the work of a government official. That's their role. Pan America's role is different. Our role is as a voice of conscience weighing in on those deliberations proving that the pragmatism of our government doesn't negate the principles of our people, reminding our leaders that trading away human rights for stability is a fool's bargain. You end up with neither. That is what makes the Penn Barbie Freedom to Write Award so important. Think about it. All of those writers who stood up in the room a minute ago, if you could be put in jail in this country for writing about sex or drugs, we would have a hell of a lot of writers. We'd have to be visiting behind bars. This award is an antidote to impervious strongmen and indifferent peoples. It's a clarion call that throws the rate of the world's greatest writers, publishers, editors, and the entire creative community on the side of freedom, on the side of Ahmed Naji. The legendary Egyptian feminist Nawal al-Sadawi 
was once told by her jailer, if I find pen and paper in your cell, it is more dangerous than if I find a gun. Ahmed Naji is continuing to write in his cell. They can deny him even pen and paper, but they cannot deny his imagination. The people of Tahrir Square were demanding not just the right to vote, but the right to paint, to sing, and to write. Creative freedom is what makes societies not just democratic, but dynamic, vibrant, engaging, and alive, and the ways that we love about our home here in New York, and in the ways that people around the world deserve. In a world where a novel can be the basis for a prosecution, where creativity can be a crime, where there are prosecutions of the imagination, a global organization of writers is as essential as a group of lawyers or doctors or diplomats. We all strive to save lives, but for Penn's work to be done, we must not just save a life, but also sustain the life of the mind. More and more, when writers are arrested or murdered, government officials now call us to find out what Penn knows or thinks or can suggest. Sometimes they even listen to our suggestions. More and more writers reach out to us, asking for help in dire circumstances. They know that when they write a provocative scene or take on a controversial theme, Penn is behind them. They know that when their book is seized, their magazine shuttered, their publisher disappeared, Penn is behind them. They know that when they're silenced or excluded because of race or gender or religion or walls built around borders, Penn America is behind them. And thanks to all of you, we've been able to expand our membership, our programs, our resources, our visibility, and our impact to keep up with those rising demands. If there's hope for Egypt's unfinished freedom, it lies with the young and undaunted. Ahmed Naji and his friends, they are the front lines of peaceful change in Egypt, and we are on the supply lines, supplying pro support, protection, and voice. When I first entered human rights work, I was a little surprised to learn how much emphasis there still was on letters written to prisoners of conscience, something J.K. Rowling, I'm sure, remembers from her days at Amnesty. It, it seemed so 1970s, but there is no Wi-Fi in jail. That snail mail is a jailed writer's only connectivity. I know two brothers who together spent three years in Tehran's dreaded Evan prison. Activists from around the world sent them letters. To this day, they carry around those letters. They bring them to events in a suitcase, and they talk about what it meant in that jail cell to know that they were not alone. A few minutes ago, we honored J.K. Rowling, in part for books that some call fantasy, and, and she says uh, aren't. And I, I now want to share something that you might think is a fantasy, but that I believe isn't. Take a look up there to the balcony. Now imagine a lone figure who emerges unannounced, dressed for a party, mustache and all. It's Ahmed Naji, smiling and free, carrying a copy of his new novel and a suitcase full of letters he received from all of us. We're going to write those notes in just a minute, and I hope all of you do, uh, and join me. But before we start that, it's my pleasure to introduce Ahmed's brother, Mohammed Naji.
Thank you, Susan. Hello, everyone. I am Mohammed Nagy, Ahmed the brother. Ahmed sent you all his, his greeting and wishes he could be here tonight. Right now, he is in solitary confinement. This is something I am living with now. This is the meaning of imprisonment. He is not allowed to write a message to be read at this important event. Because letting out message written by a prisoner is a dangerous thing. Any written messages from a prisoner in Egypt require a permit and would be subject to, to the monitoring of a prisoner administration. I think this is to reinforce the prison, the prison sense of being isolated, which is the main aspect of Ahmed's punishment. Since the beginning of this event, which our, which our entire family has had to endure, and which has also caused my older brother friend to suffer very much, I have come to see that part of his uh, imprisonment sentence is to try to deny him from any freedom, any form of joy. This is why he is banned from writing, something he has done his entire life, growing up together. I, al I was always caught him, I, I always caught sight of him, musing, absorbed in his magical world, to tell us his mystical tales. Ahmed's imagination is his perpetual game. He is not present at this event because because of what his imagination depicted, unfortunately. Writing for Ahmed is both professional matter and life choice. And right now, he is paying the price of his linguistic choices, despite the constitutional and legal texts that in Egypt which should protect him from imprisonment. He is fighting against a status quo that does not care much about literature and the freedom of writers. At each visit, Ahmed keeps telling us about the new novel he is writing. He is not writing it the way he normally writes literature, using his computer connected to the internet and while listening to music, all of which are unavoidable in prison, of course. So he is thinking about writing as a novel, which he cannot actually write. He is imagining it like he always has. Although Ahmed has been stripped of all his fundamental rights due to, due to laws that disregard freedom of expression, which is protected in Egypt constitution, and also in the, in the international covenant on human rights that Egypt has signed, they cannot take away his right to imagination. My brother is not the only Arab who is going through this, but he is the first Egyptian to be condemned and suspended for two years in prison because of his writing. Ahmed and our family hope that awarding him this prize will highlight the crackdown on the freedom of his expression in Arab world. He was not punished for some sort of political activism, but for writing a novel in which the character do what normal people all over the world do. For this, court decided to sentence him to harsh experience behind bars. Young Egyptian author was forced under this condition to fight a personal fight. He stepped into this crisis to see the free space for expression. His case, his case could be a chance for us all to amend oppressive laws in Egypt. Since the beginning of this absurd event, I have been reflecting on, Ahmed review, on Ahmed's view of the world. I see it in the books and the copies of Henry Matisse's painting, which he specifically asked for. I cannot respond for, to his request because the prison administration does not allow prisoners to have illustration, comics, painting, and their like. But this incident has shown me how strong Ahmed is and how strong his imagination is. Although he is in prison for violating the sanctity of public morals, this does not stop him from requesting a copy of Matisse's The Dance. I wonder whatever this was another way to challenge their authority. In the end, I would like to express my gratitude and most certainly Ahmed's gratitude to Ben for all its support. Thank you. We could bring, bring the lights back up. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. 
Okay, everyone, on your table, there is our stack of cards, and they, they look like this. And there are also markers. And we would love if each of you could think of a short message that you would like to write to Ahmed Naji, because he can receive letters and notes. And please sign your name so he can see the exceptional group of people who are reaching through the bars of his prison cell to touch him and connect him to the world. And when you're done, if you want to take a quick selfie or snapshot with the others at your table, please do. And then bring your placard upstairs. You can see some of your friends have already done this. We're going to post these all upstairs and join us back for dessert in the Roosevelt Rotunda, where we started the evening. And we will have a place for you to post your placard so that together we create a solid wall of support for Ahmed that will be seen around the world. Finally, it's my pleasure to offer a last thanks to everyone who made tonight possible, including the extraordinary Penn staff. Thank you all for being with us here tonight to celebrate free expression and for standing with Penn in our mission to defend it. We're all busy. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this evening's program.